Well, you seem to be suggesting that these comatose states, rather than we view them as, as vegetative states, they might be something more akin to a yogic state of samadhi or a state of higher consciousness. Uh, I, I, I don't assume it. I, I know that from working with people close to death. Everyone that we've worked with who is dying and isn't just simply brain injured, but everyone, Jeffrey, everyone, including the, the most unintelligent, the person who has never studied spiritual stuff and is not the least bit interested in almost everyone comes back and they start seeing stars. They talk about the, the planets or they talk about love or about going home. It's incredible. So I know people are not just vegetating down there. I, I know it. We've discovered that. I mean, it suggests that we all could learn a great deal from interacting or having being in the presence of these people. That's right. Someone who is dying uh, could be our greatest teacher. They're not the person that we knew ahead of time. They're the deepest aspect of that person. And when that starts to come out, it is incredible. It transforms grief and sadness even. If you can make contact with a person of this state before they die, it is a, it's almost a, it's not a celebration when somebody's dying, but it's, but it's a magnificent interaction. Mm -hmm. They speak from great distance and with great wisdom. The deepest parts of themselves come out. Well, this raises some major ethical questions mm -hmm. about the comatose state and, and what right. it means for our society. And, and many people who say, I don't want to live like a vegetable if I'm ever in that state, pull mm -hmm. the plug and, That's right. and, and so on. Well, uh, maybe I can share some of our discoveries here. Mm -hmm. One of them is that the living will idea that you say, if I ever go into a comatose state, I don't want to live anymore. Uh, that's important to take into consideration, but what a person writes in his normal or her normal state of consciousness and what they experience when they're in deep, altered states of consciousness, like comatose states, is very different. Few people know themselves at that depth. So, like for example, one of the people I describe in that book was a professor and he said, if I ever go into a vegetative state, pull the plugs. But when we went down with him into that state when he got sick, we, we visited him for just one time, and his family was terribly upset. Should we allow him to die or what? We work with these facial signals and the eye movements and different parts of his chin and the shaking of his jaw, putting your finger like that just for a moment on somebody's jaw. And this was a man whose jaw was like frozen shut. And we developed a communication system so that he could answer us by moving that jaw. Mm -hmm. And when we asked him, do you now want to die? Would you like your family to encourage the medical community around you to just allow you to die? And he opened his mouth very widely, which was the signal to say uh, that he was a no. He opened his mouth like that, which meant, mm -hmm. don't let me die. And we asked him questions and got feedback from what he was doing down there, Jeffrey. Now, let me interrupt yeah. you because I get the sense that what you've managed to establish is a system where they can give you yes and no answers. Exactly. Non-verbal. So we say yeah. to him, uh, if you're going to say no, can you do something now to show us? And he goes like that with his mouth. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to say yes, what is it? And he was going to wrinkle his eyes mm. like that. Yeah. So like an idiomotor response in hypnosis. That's right, exactly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, I was, people who have known uh, Erickson and hypnotic methods who have seen us do this work say, well, it looks like hypnosis, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So once having established that, you have, some mo you have a mode of communicating with a person. And our ethics are that, and these are an ethics that need to be developed more, but at this point, the, our ethics say that you need to have at least two states of consciousness, an answer from a person in two states of consciousness. In their normal state of consciousness, in other words, like you and I are yes. talking right now, what do you do when, you wanna, when you're dying and get caught in a coma? And the second state needs to be taken into consideration too, the dream or comatose state. Mm -hmm. And he said he wanted to go on living. So we have another piece of information. Then we asked him why and asked him various questions. There's a whole group of questions we ask people in comatose states. And one of them, he was a man in his 80s or, or, or early 90s. I can't remember what it was now. And he was interested in having an affair. <laughs> he was interested in having an affair. Mm -hmm. And we wondered why his wife hadn't come 
to, she wasn't interested in visiting him. Yeah. They had had some trouble or something like that. So he was interested in having an affair. Mm -hmm. He was having an affair, in fact. In, in his that, inner world. In his inner world, he yes. was fantasying or dreaming of being together with a woman, mm -hmm. some beautiful woman of some sort, and they were hiking up a mountain together. And this now, the uh, class, more classical psychologist would say, so he's individuating, he's growing, he's getting contact with his feminine side or something. But he was experiencing this as having an affair. Mm -hmm. So when his children saw that, they were smiling to one another and say, well, Papa would never, ever have done anything like that in his normal life. But if, and they were there looking at that, they said, well, gee, let's let him go on. And so this man went on another three or four months in that state. And uh, then one day, we weren't there at this time, then just suddenly died. Mm -hmm. That was the end of it. In other words, the, the processes that go on in the comatose state yes. may be spiritually, psychologically valuable for the person. Yes. That We're, necessary to complete before they die. That's right. It, yes. And we have just a few minutes left, but yeah. I do want to touch on the possibility of bringing people out of the coma yes. from this state. Is that also part of your experience? That's the work, to bring people out of comatose states or at least to communicate with them in those states yeah so that you know what they're doing and that they appreciate people are not comatose because they want to be left alone to die. People go comatose because that's the only state or the best state for them right now. They need to go internal and work on themselves to complete a part of their own personal life that hasn't yeah. been completed until now. now. One of the things that you wrote, which I think is a crucial point, is that sometimes people stay in comas because they get stuck in their internal process. And yes. if you can help them move through that process, That's through right. your communication, That's right. then they're able to come out. That's right. Like Sam, who needed to decide whether he could go on vacation. Mm -hmm. just, just exactly that. Do, are people able to actually, though, re recover physically and live a normal physical life? One of the people I saw was having already chain Stokes breathing, which means she was just about dying and drowning to death. And when I went in to work with her, uh, to make the story short, because I know we're near the end of this mm -hmm. particular program, I, how many minutes do we have? No, just a few. A few minutes. Mm -hmm. Well, I went in and I put my hand in on her and followed her breathing like I was talking about. And... Uh, it turned out that she had gotten afraid. Mm -hmm. She was dying of cancer, but that sometime earlier in her life she'd become afraid of finishing things. Mm -hmm. And so I said to her, if you weren't lazy and you weren't afraid, what would you do? And she opened her eyes. Those were the days in Switzerland too when they're using whole oxygen tents, not just... Mm -hmm. She opened her eyes in this oxygen tent. She put her head up even though she was almost dead. Mm -hmm. And she said, I have to go back to work and finish up my my business on the Bahnhofstrasse in Zurich. Hmm. So I said, what does that mean? She said, I have to get my business in order. And she sat up and she started, got the edge of the bed and I said, wait a minute, you can't do that. You've got <laughs> full of tubes. This is not possible. Mm -hmm. And so I need to also say that, that some people awaken so much that they forget that they're in the hospital. They want to literally go home and some need to go home. So you need to be able to work with people in those states too. Right. But I said to her, well, wait a minute, you've got to sign papers and your family needs to come here and all that. So, but she got up uh, that day, got dressed, and in her very weak state, went home. Six or seven years later, she died after having finished up her relationship problems and also worked on her business in downtown Zurich. Well, I suppose much of the work that you do has to do with the transition then between these That's states right. of consciousness. That's right. It's not enough just to work with subtle signals. And it's not enough just to know the psychology of people. You have to work with the whole transition as that goes from one, one level to another. Mm -hmm. That's just right. Yeah. Arnold Mandel, it's been a pleasure, what a pleasure yes. to, to talk to you about this work. It's, mm -hmm. it's such a joy to be with somebody who yeah. has such a range of experience in terms of states of consciousness. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for being with me. Thanks, Jeffrey. It's a pleasure. Yes. Mm -hmm. And thank you very much for being with us.